Disney Channel versus Nickelodeon, a rivalry that has been running for the past 30 years or so. I would say that for the most part, the two companies have been able to keep up with one another. When it comes to sitcoms, it can really go either way. When it comes to cartoons, you can argue that it can still go either way. But there are some elements that one channel definitely has an advantage over when compared to the other. For starters, can you name a single iconic Disney Channel game show? Probably not. No, the Disney Channel games do not count. One avenue that Disney definitely has the upper hand with is original movies. I mean, Disney would drop like three, sometimes even four original movies a year, and at least two of them would become cult classics, or even sometimes huge hits in the case of High School Musical and The Cheetah Girl, stuff like that. Nickelodeon, on the other hand, made original movies less frequently, and no one really cared about any of them. When was the last time you saw someone bring up Spectacular? Or, a uh, Gym Teacher? No, no, no. What about Shredder Man Rules? Ain't nobody talking about that nowadays. The only Nick movie I see people bring up nowadays that's not already attached to a series is Rags. I don't even remember what it was about. All I remember is, I follow my dream. Like, bro, if you don't stop screaming so loud. I plan on covering a lot of these Nick movies soon, but the one that I wanted to start with is one that I actually remember watching when it came out, Best Player. A movie starring Jerry Trainer and Jeanette McCurdy from iCarly that came out in 2011, where they play gamers. That's all I remember, honestly. So I thought now would be the perfect time to look back at the film and talk about it. See if it's actually worth talking about because clearly nobody else wants to tackle it. I'm Mr. Nostalgia and in today's video, we will be discussing the Disney Chat <clears throat> Nickelodeon original movie best player. In the world of competitive video gaming, there are two major players. Prodigy's coming for you. No! And in a brand new movie, the ultimate title is up for grabs. Grand prize, $175,000. Tonight, we take down Prodigy. It's Jerry Trainer. Booyah! Versus Jeanette McCurdy. That's how I roll. In Best Player, premiering this March. Only on Nick. All right, let's take it back to the year 2011, the year we were all shuffling every day, the year the Black Eyed Peas just couldn't get enough, and most importantly, the year Mr. Popper's Penguins came out, an all-time classic. March 12th specifically, though, is the day we will be focusing it on because that is the day Best Player premiered on Nickelodeon. It stars Jerry Trainer, shouldn't really have to explain who he is, and Jeanette McCurdy, shouldn't really have to explain who she is either. The movie also stars Jean-Luc Bilodeau? Jean-Luc Bilodeau. What's up, guys? You and got it right. I got it right. Yeah, nice. I've been practicing. Who you might recognize from the Disney Channel original movie, 16 Wishes. And Carissa Tynes, who is also from 16 Wishes. How fun. According to Google, this movie also stars Halle Berry, but I am fairly certain that is not true. The movie begins with Jerry Trainer's character, Quincy Johnson, playing a video game. You see, Quincy, otherwise known to the gaming community as Q, is basically the ninja of this universe. He's an online celebrity and a well-respected gamer who more or less is the best of the best, even though he still lives with his parents. Something you'll notice pretty early on in the movie is that Jerry Trainer is basically just reprising his role as Spencer for this film. The only difference is that he's hyper fixated on games and not sculpting. Quincy hops on his motorcycle and takes a trip over to the Chinese food restaurant where he works. Hey, look, Starbucks, nice. We see a little routine of his daily life, which consists of doing delivery driving for his restaurant and playing video games. Oh, nice, my guy playing Crash Bandicoot. Okay, off to a good start, I'm not gonna lie. Quincy ends up getting fired from his job and at the worst possible time too, because his parents tell him that they are moving away to Florida and he needs to get his own place. Quincy obviously doesn't wanna go, especially since he finally got the basement to look exactly like how he wanted it to look. He proposes an idea to his parents, where instead of selling the house to a random stranger, they sell it to him instead so he can continue to live there. But the thing is, he doesn't know how much houses actually cost, so when he hears that they'd sell it to him for $175,000, he's pretty much flabbergasted. Spence, uh, I mean Quincy, talks to his online friend Wendell. 
Wendell tells him about this new game called Black Hole, which is launching with a big tournament where the winner wins $175,500. How convenient. Quincy says that that is just the right amount needed to buy the house and still have some money left over. Clearly, he doesn't realize, though, that nobody just buys a house and stops paying for it. I mean, you still have bills and insurance and stuff. And how does he expect to pay for his internet, exactly? Look, man, I know a thing or two about owning a house, okay? I've owned this one for a few years. Actually, now that I think about it, have you guys ever seen the other rooms in my house? Let's do a quick house tour. This is my yard. This is my backyard. This is my hallway. This is my bedroom. Don't ask why I don't have a bed. It's none of your business. And, uh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not quite sure why I put all my Funko Pops out here in my living room, honestly. But, uh, yeah. That is my house. The point is, owning a house is hard. So, it's kind of silly for him to think that all of his problems would go away if he just purchased a house in one shot. Although, I guess it is within his character to be so dumb to the point where he doesn't even realize that. Let it be known, though, to all the future homeowners out there, to truly sustain a house, you will absolutely need some sort of job or steady income. Which is why you're about to watch a couple ads. Gotti! <laughs> Gotti! <laughs> you're watching Best Player. Yes! We'll be right back. Now back to Best Player. Let's do this. On Nick. Quincy purchases the game and sets it up. I, I ain't gonna lie, this game actually seems kind of fun. My first thoughts while watching this is that there was no way Nickelodeon didn't turn this into an actual game on the website or something. And, thanks to the Wayback Machine, I was able to find out that they did. Hey, can we check out the comment section real quick though, from like, what, 11 years ago? Let's just see what some of these people had to say. How do you get such high scores? My highest score is only 3,000. You gotta do better than that, bro. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta do better, all right? Gold42503 says, I watched the movie like 10 times on Nick. That is a complete lie because there is no way they actually aired Best Player more than like five times. The ratings couldn't have been that good. Truthfully speaking, if these are any of you guys, just like let me know. That would be so cool to like reconnect with, with some of you. Like look, if you remember your usernames, what, like, all to dude, all to dude, you gotta be out there somewhere. Come on, bro. Alright, let's get back to the movie. Quincy starts celebrating his victory when a new opponent named Prodigy shows up. Prodigy starts cooking Quincy. Dude even takes his head off, it's pretty crazy. Quincy starts to get really agitated after losing to them several times, so he decides to take some accidental advice from his mother that he should try to look them up to see who they are in real life. He asked Wendell, who by the way, appeared in an episode of Zeke and Luther once, to find their address, which totally isn't creepy or problematic at all. Wendell picks up Quincy at the bus stop because as it turns out, Prodigy conveniently lives in San Francisco, near them. They pull up to their house and Quincy gets out of the car. I don't, I don't really know what his plan was here, to be completely honest with you. I, I don't even really think he knew either, because while he's on his way to Prodigy's doorstep, he's going over different ideas on what he can potentially pose as. He gets to their doorstep and rings the bell, only for a teenage girl to open the door. Yup. As it turns out, Prodigy is a 16-year-old girl. And these two idiots looked up her address and went to her house to meet up with her. Prodigy's real name is Christina Saunders, who goes by Chris for short, because she's some kind of tomboy, I guess. Man, Nickelodeon. Where did you get the idea to cast Jeanette McCurdy as a time boy as character who shortens their name? Good thinking, guys. Chris is under the assumption that Quincy is her mom's internet date that was also supposed to arrive at the same time, coincidentally. After being let in, Quincy finds out that Prodigy and Chris are the same person and freaks out. Prodigy's coming for you. Oh, ouch! I bet you didn't know your hammer could fit up there, did you? <laughs> From now on, my headcanon is that this is just an alternate world in the iCarly multiverse. Meanwhile, Chris's mom's real date shows up, looking fresh out of America's Funniest Home Videos. <laughs> I forgot I wrote that! Looking fresh out of America's Funniest Home Videos. 
Wendell tackles him, which presumably kills him because we don't see him for the rest of the movie. Chris and Quincy engage in some small talk while Chris's mom gets ready. My mom's the first person who agreed to go out with you? Of course not. Lots of women want to go out with me. Ladies love me. So you're a womanizer. Whoa! Chris's mom comes downstairs finally and greets Quincy. Fun fact for the Avatar fans out there, this woman is actually the voice of Korra. So go crazy with that information. Here's something that makes absolutely no sense though. Not that I've ever been on any dating sites, but is it not a rule that you have to include your picture in your profile? How else is a person supposed to choose you? Like, like did you really just choose someone's profile based off of vibes and vibes alone? What if bro came in looking like Modoc or something? No, but seriously, that's some really bad writing. I mean, you can tell the only reason why this plays out the way that it does is because it needs to for the sake of the plot. That's the worst kind of writing, for real. Quincy takes Tracy on a date, and while he's there, he lies to her saying that he's a home ec teacher for Chris's school, a lie concocted by Wendell. At some point during the date, Tracy told Quincy that if Chris gets another F, she will take away her video games. So now all Quincy has to do is ruin her project. If she can't play video games, then she can't beat Quincy, which means the prize money is all his. The next morning, Quincy wakes up to a duck on him. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely Spencer, all right. Wendell informs Quincy that today is his first day at school. As it turns out, Wendell actually did sign Quincy up to be a teacher at Chris's school. It wasn't just a cover-up. They came up with a fake story where Quincy is actually a graduate from Harvard and Wendell poses as a window cleaner. In the hallway, Chris bumps into a mean girl. Watch it, walk much? Whatevs. Scurry on. And you better be supporting me for prom queen, freak. Wow, that is like every cliche Mean Girl 2000s character line, even down to her name being Cindy. Bold prediction, not sure if it's true or not, but I have a feeling that her boyfriend, if she has one, is on the sports scene. Calling it now. Ah, uh, there's the boyfriend. Okay, all right, we're getting things rolling. Chris continues her walk to class when her classmate Sheldon walks up and starts talking to her. I say classmate because I can't really tell if they're supposed to be friends or not. I mean, Chris tells them to just shut up when he starts talking, but Sheldon also implies that they do in fact talk to each other because Chris told her about the black hole video game. I also don't get why Chris, who presumably doesn't have any friends, is mean to Sheldon. I mean, he's just about the only person that actually likes her. You'd think she'd be a little more tolerant of him. Quincy gets assigned to his class, and what do you know, he's in the same class as Chris. Chris is rightfully so confused by this, but Quincy doesn't let that stop him from giving his fake lecture about poultry, which consists of everyone sticking their hands in chickens, slamming it on the desk, and singing a song about how it's chicken time. He then chucks a chicken at the principal. That's probably the funniest joke in the movie, honestly. That night, Quincy and Wendell sneak into the school to sabotage Chris's project, but the next morning shows that their efforts to ruin her project failed. It instead enhanced it. A little too much. As it turns out, her teacher isn't even mad at her. Instead of giving her an F, he gives her an A, which means Quincy's plans really backfired on him, and now he's forced to come up with a new plan. A plan that includes going over to the Saunders household and turning off their electricity so Sam, I mean Chris, doesn't have a chance to enter the contest. Surely, nothing could go wrong. This dude's really wearing a pwned shirt, wow. Quincy arrives at the Saunders house and is greeted once again to Chris. After chopping it up with Tracy, Quincy takes off to find the fuse box so he can turn off the switch connected to Chris's room, and he successfully does so. After telling her mom what happened, Chris is allowed to use another computer in the house. Quincy then has to come up with another excuse to leave the dinner table to unplug the router so she can't connect to the internet. After doing that, he sits back down and- What is that? What is that? What is she feeding to Quincy? Blobfish? This that stuff that Grandpa Max be serving to Ben and Gwen while they be camping, bruh. And you just know whatever that is, it ain't seasoned either, but that's a whole different, that's a whole different conversation, you know what I'm saying? Chris quickly realizes that the internet is down and Tracy recommends that she steals the neighbor's Wi-Fi instead. Not really sure that's great advice coming from a parent, but hey, whatever. Wendell doesn't take to this very lightly because he's a dork. So he suits up with some electrician gear and tries to get the deed done himself. He climbs up the telephone pole and cuts one of the wires. I feel like, as an adult, you know, 
a grown man. He should have known that this wasn't going to work. Quincy and Wendell both are insanely stupid for their age, but Wendell specifically acts so dumb to the point where I can't even laugh at this stuff. Like, it's just weird and kind of alarming how much of a child he acts like. His biggest op is a teenage girl. Who is he, Dr. Draken? Chris interrupts Quincy and Tracy as they're about to kiss to tell them that she is officially into the contest. Tracy mentions how it's late and that he should probably head home, which Quincy doesn't hesitate to do after realizing he only has 14 minutes left to qualify for the contest. While playing the game, it's obvious that Wendell is a bit fed up with Quincy at this point due to him spending more time with Tracy than actually trying to take down Chris. So much so to the point that he's been practicing the game more and more while Quincy is all flirting and stuff. I only mention this because it actually comes back later in the story, so just keep your eye out for that, I guess. Quincy qualifies for the tournament and gets an idea about how to take down Chris. He decides to use the one weakness that every teenage girl, according to him at least, has, which is love. He wants to find Chris a date to the prom so she will go there instead of the gaming tournament, since they're on the same day. The only issue is, nobody has any interest in taking her. Matter of fact, every guy that Quincy talked to about it ended up leaving the classroom. So now he has to come up with yet another plan. The next scene, which is actually one of the only scenes in the movie I remember, the class is making fortune cookies. Basically, you have to take two cookies, write a little note on a piece of paper, and stick it in between the two cookies. You then pass it to the person of whom you want to receive it. The thing is though, Cindy uses this to play a prank on Chris. She fakes a note to make it seem like it was done by Ash, Chris's crush and the note is basically him asking her if she wants to go out. Chris, however, gets privy to the situation, but before things get too crazy, Sheldon swoops in and eats the note so nobody can see the evidence of Chris checking yes. Quincy talks to Sheldon about what happened earlier and about his obvious crush on Chris, and he says that he will help him increase his cool status in order to make him more appealing to her. One of the ways he does this is by having him try out for the football team. Sheldon then works up the nerve to talk to Chris and right when he's about to ask her to go to prom, Dez from Austin and Natalie pushes him to the ground. And wow, he gives him an atomic wedgie. Something that only happens in movies and shows, especially from this era. Ash walks up to confront Dez about what he's doing and boom, what did I say? Cindy's boyfriend is on the football team. I knew it. The mean girl plus sports star combination remains undefeated. Chris is clearly more interested in Ash though, which rubs Sheldon the wrong way. He now uses this as motivation to ball out on the field, only to end up getting tackled. Quincy starts telling Wendell about how now he has to pivot his plan in another direction. Instead of using Sheldon, he's going to try to get Ash to ask her out. And the only way to do that is to try to make Chris more interesting to Ash. While he's saying this though, Chris logs on to Black Hole as Prodigy which Quincy finds interesting because she's supposed to be studying instead. So, Quincy calls Chris, and the two somehow end up talking about how she likes Ash. Quincy genuinely believes that she has a chance with Ash, but Chris doesn't see it. She thinks that because of the fact that Cindy is way more popular than her, she won't get the time of day. So Quincy comes up with an idea that would show Ash how cool she is by introducing some common ground between them, video games. So he somehow got the school to sign off on taking the class on a field trip to an arcade because that is totally where a home ec teacher would take kids on a field trip. Chris walks up to Ash as he's with his friends and asks if she can join them. And in the background, we hear City Is Ours by Big Time Rush, in case you forgot what company made this movie. A good song, good song, I'm not mad at the music choice. Chris does a really good job against Ash, which doesn't make Cindy very happy. The two end up dancing and stuff while the most generic 2000s kids movie song plays. Now I learned my lesson from the Starstruck video, we ain't playing all that music. Cindy unplugs the game because she's a terrible person, and Ash gets mad and leaves, with Chris following right behind them. They talk for a bit, and eventually he mentions how he would like to go to the prom with her, meaning Quincy's plan was a success. That is, until they get to the Saunders household. Quincy tells Chris that it doesn't matter that she'll miss the tournament because there are plenty of other ones she can attend. So while they look for some online, one of the sites they go on has a picture of Quincy aka Q, on the front page. Now, up until this point, I thought Quincy's identity was mostly kept private. Obviously, Wendell knew who he was, 
and he even told a couple kids earlier in the movie, but I didn't realize that Q's identity was genuinely out there. This picture proves though, that he is out there, face hanging out and everything, which means just about anyone in the gaming community should theoretically know who he is, right? So if Prodigy is really in the games, then shouldn't she already know what he looks like? Now you could argue that maybe Prodigy is new to games or doesn't keep up with the online discourse about it, but even then, Q literally walks into an arcade where people should know who he is and nobody recognizes him, especially considering the reason why he's on the front page of this website is because he broke four records in said arcade. Not a single kid in the school recognizes him either. Look, it's kind of hard to tell just how much Q's identity is out there, so I won't call this a plot hole or bad writing solely because I have no actual evidence to support me. It's just a little fishy in my opinion. A little fishy. Anyway, Chris figures out who Quincy is, as does Tracy. The funny part about this scene is while Quincy is explaining everything to Chris and Tracy, he conveniently left out the part about how he doxed her. I am no cop, but I feel like he could def get into some trouble for that. Quincy gets kicked out and is forced to go back to Wendell's house. But as it turns out, Wendell has turned on him as well. While he's been off having fun with the Saunders family, Wendell has been training hard to beat both Q and Prodigy in the tournament so he can win the prize money himself. Wendell kicks Q out, which means now he's forced to sleep at the laser tag place. The next morning he goes to the library and talks to Chris and tries to explain himself that not everything he did was a lie, but she didn't want to hear it. But all of those feelings have to be put to the side now, because it is officially time for the moment we've all been waiting for, the tournament. All the contestants arrive and the battle commences. It's kind of hard to give a description for any of the video game stuff, but Q is the winner of the first round. Wendell, on the other hand, uses a different strategy to win. Hey, dude, uh, Vulcan, your dad, like, he left. He said he didn't love you. I don't, I don't... What? <laughs> Chris also moves on to the next round after taking out her opponent, but in the middle of her celebration, it gets announced that one last contestant has entered the battle. I feel like this shouldn't be allowed, but whatever. Turns out, Sheldon, aka Shellshock, has arrived at the tournament and will now take part in the battle with everyone else. Shellshock is a pretty dope name, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's pretty fire. When the judges introduce him though, they say that part of his origin story is that he asked Prodigy to the prom and she said no which technically is not what happened. Before Prodigy could even give an answer, Shonen got beat up by Dez from Austin and Alley. She never said yes or no. I love when writers forget their own story. Shonen moves on to the next round, meaning that the only remaining people left are him, Quincy, Chris, and Wendell. Oh wow, it just so happens to be the only four people that had real roles in the movie. How convenient. Before the final match starts though, Quincy starts declaring his love for Miss Saunders and everyone mistakes her for trash talk, but he's being dead serious. He is genuinely in love with this woman he met like 5 days ago. Anyway, she doesn't even respond to this and they just keep playing on like nothing happened. Prodigy is battling Q and Wendell is battling Shellshock. Together though, Q and Prodigy take down Wendell, with Quincy delivering the final blow that takes out both of them. Chris is under the impression that she won. But that is far from the case, because Sheldon is still in the building, and plans on claiming his prize money, cause my guy Sheldon is a bag chaser. Sheldon demolishes Chris and uh, actually ends up winning the tournament. The most unrealistic part of this movie is Chris and Quincy losing their chances to win $175,000 and smiling about it. But I guess it's kinda nice to see Sheldon win? I don't know, they kinda didn't lead to this at all in the movie, so it wasn't a very satisfying ending. And it's weird too because they definitely had the pieces to set up this moment but didn't properly execute them. Throughout the entire movie, Sheldon is getting beat up or taking some sort of L, so in that case, it does make sense why he would get the win. But the entire movie is so focused on Q, Chris, Wendell, and Tracy, you kind of forget that this guy also has an arc in this movie. If you gave Sheldon a couple more scenes, one of which where he just talks to Quincy about how all his life he's felt like he's only taken losses and wants to have at least one win under his name, it would make this scene a lot more impactful, because us as an audience would want to root for him. But I mean, it just feels so weird and meaningless having Sheldon win this when nothing in the movie even slightly teased that that was going to happen. In the next and final scene, Chris meets up with her mom and what do you know, Ash appears. 
Turns out he was there the whole time, and although he was a bit bummed they couldn't spend that time at the prom, he tells her that they can still go if she wants to, and the two head off. And to wrap up our other romance subplot, Quincy walks up to Tracy and tells her he's sorry and wants to make up. And as a grin starts to appear on Tracy's face, Big Night by Big Time Rush begins to play in the background. Because in case you forgot, this is a Nickelodeon movie. It's gonna be a big, 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 big night. That is the dumbest ending I have ever seen in a children's movie. I mean, wow, I couldn't think of a more anticlimactic way to end this thing. I was kind of hoping that the credit sequence would show what actually ended up happening with Quincy and Tracy because technically Quincy is still homeless right now. His parents no doubt sold the house and there's no way he's scratching with Wendell ever again. The only new thing that we actually learned in these credits is that Sheldon clearly has a type. I'm not gonna lie, I paused the movie and laughed for like five minutes when I saw this. It was so unexpected and random, like who came up with this? Anyway, yeah, this uh, this movie wasn't very good. I'm, I'm sad to report. And I mean that, I was, I was actually really hoping to enjoy this movie, but I didn't. I think the biggest issue with this film is that it was a bit confused as to what it was trying to be. I feel like this was originally pitched as a PG-13 theatrical film and the Nickelodeon picked it up and made it kid friendly instead because this movie really did focus heavy on adults, which is rare for original movies, both Nick and Disney. In the same movie where we have to care about this adult pro gamer's career, it's weird that we also have to care about this 16 year old girl's love life. And it's also weird that in this movie where we have to care about this 16 year old girl's love life, we also have to care about this grown man's love life. This movie was not advertised as a romance, so I was definitely surprised to see how heavily it focused on it. It started as a video game centric story and ended as a love story. And to me, you should just pick one. I really don't see why this would be a story to tell for a Nickelodeon film. It's the fact that both stories are pretty boring. And 9 times out of 10, being boring is worse than being poorly written. Although this movie was both of those things, that's for sure. And I guess that's why nobody's talked about it in a decade. <laughs> I'll probably give this movie like a 2.5 out of 10, maybe 2 out of 10, I don't know. But at the end of the day, that's just my opinion on the movie. What I want to know is your opinion on the movie. Did you like it? Did you hate it? Do you have no memory of it? Let me know in the comments below. Also make sure you let me know what other Nick movies you want me to review on my channel. There aren't many, so I see no reason why I shouldn't be able to cover most of them eventually. Subscribe if you're new, and as always, I'm Mr. Nostalgia, and I'm out for now. Peace.